James, the fourth chapter, verses one through four, as you well can see on your paper, if everybody has one. Okay. Everybody has one. Now, the title here is might frighten you a moment, but it shouldn't. Hedonistic reversionism. That don't want to frighten you, Jacob. Okay, I don't want to frighten you with it. We fed you just in case. <laughs> don't want to frighten you. But <clears throat> that's the Greek word. Hedonism is a Greek word. Now, we're familiar probably with the term, but in our text, at least in the New American Standard Bible from which I'm reading, it's going to be the word pleasure. It's going to be the word pleasure in verse 1 and 3, so pay attention to that. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? He's talking to the church. He's actually talking to Jewish believers who have been dispersed under persecution to other nations. They have fled. And he's writing to them, Christian Jews. That's James 1.1. 1, 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Notice there are two questions. That's the first one. Notice there are two questions. That's the first one. And pay attention to the second question because he gives the answer of the first one. Is it not the source? Is not the source? What is the source? Is not the source your pleasure, as the Greek word for hedonism? Hedone. Is it not the source of your pleasure that wage war in your members? Then he gives an example of how this hedonistic pleasure works in your life you probably by by now you probably have people somewhere in your kin people that have gone through hedonistic pleasures we would probably refer to them as addictions you lust and do not have that's a that word there lust is epithumia that deals with lust of the sin nature. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You've probably met people, maybe grew up with them like I have, grew up with them in school. Maybe, maybe, even, maybe even in high school, you became friends where you weren't, maybe in grade school, you know? took different classes together, and maybe even college. And these people have got themselves in the need of so much pleasure that they rob and commit murder uh, to find that pleasure. See, it's about pleasure. It's the word hedone. You lust and do not have, you commit murder. And you are envious and cannot obtain. You're obsessed. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Your prayer life has just gone to pot, literally. You ask, i.e. pray, and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That's a funny translation, I suppose. It actually comes from the word kakos. It's an, your motives are evil. God is not going to give you what you're asking because you're going to throw the divine assets away that God would give you on pleasure, addictive behavior. He's not going to do that. 
you do not have because you do not pray right. You pray, ask, and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motive, with evil intent, in regard to what God does. I mean, you're asking God to do something God is never going to do. It has evil motive. It, it works against the plan of God in your life. It doesn't work for it. Of course, he's not going to do that. So that you may spend, he asks for it, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, that's a spiritual terming for the way their relationship is with God. A marriage, a spiritual marriage. You do not know you do not know that friendship with the world, who is the source of your pleasure, is hostility towards God. See, that's a question. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yeah, he's talking about the the whole world. Go to that's a good question. Take it. Let's go to First John five a moment. Let's just slide over there and just show you what he has reference to, Jacob. What he has reference to. There are many passages, but here is First John five nineteen and twenty that might help us if I can get out of the Book of Revelation. There, First John five nineteen. Five. First John five. He says, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps himself, and the evil one, talking about Satan, <clears throat> does not touch him. We know that we are of God. Here's our verse, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There's more information. You could go to more information on that, like in John 12 through 16 chapters. That's chapters 12 through 16. Then in verse 20, he says, and we know there. See, he asks you, see, in verse 18, we know. Look at verse 19. We know. Look at verse 20. We know. How do, you, well, how do you know this stuff? Word of God. Word of God's the only way you know this. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we might know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. See that? What, this is the world system that stands in opposition to the divine system of God. Satan runs the world system. God runs the divine system, the kingdom of God. That's what we have reference to. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into James a little bit and try to understand what James is talking about and how I've described it in James 4 as heathenistic reversionism. Let us pray. I gave you a moment of silence to... Pause for a moment to understand that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people. Unbelievers can't understand it. 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's foolishness to them. But those who believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised on the dead the third day, which is called the gospel, when they believe that, the gospel according to Romans 1.16, is, is the power of God to save those who believe it. And then the Bible becomes a spiritual book, a spiritual guidance for life. Not only in time, but eternity. Now, You can't learn the Bible, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in a Christian's life is personal sin. 
that personal sin could be in the category of mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins as declared and identified by the word of God, what is sin. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sin and that which we know of, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is the responsibility of the priest in the church age. Every believer is a priest, according to 1 Peter 2. He's a priest. Priest is responsible to take care of his sins and minister the truth of the word of God to other people, such as I just did. So I give you a moment through your priesthood to confess sin. Identified whatever has been identified as sin in your life, confess it so that the Holy Spirit who dwells inside a believer's life can minister the truth of the Word of God to you tonight. You didn't come this way for no reason at all. Whatever motivated you to stop in, drive in, or be here, both by automobile, by foot, or by internet, this is your opportunity of one hour to get some things straight in your life with God. So, Father, we thank you for that. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth as we have confessed our sins as we know of and are ready to study the Word of God and have it study us so that it can be declared truth in our hearts. So, as Jesus said, the truth will set you free from the cosmic system of lies. The devil is a liar. He lies to us every day in every way. And the only counter to that is the truth of the word of God. God cannot lie. It aborts his character and he's not going to do that. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are looking at James, the fourth chapter, one through four. We'll be here a couple weeks. But in James 1, 4, he asks two questions. He answers the first question in the second question. Remember that now. He asks, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? And he gives the answer as what James is trying to address in his congregation of believers. He says, is, is, is not the source of your pleasures, he used the word, hedone, hedone, where we get heathenism, do not have. So, and then he goes into verses 2, 3, and 4, and he lays out an argument. How to identify it. When he does this, when he says, what is the source? He uses the word H-E-D-O-N-E, hedone. And that's where you get the word hedonism. Uh, uh, hedonistic or hedonism. He uses this word in verse 1 by the word pleasure, which is a good word. And he uses it again in verse Three, notice that. The word pleasure. It is the word pleasure. It is the same word. And so he's trying to address a problem in the Christian way of life. Not in the problem of the world, but in the church. Do you understand? Now, hedonism is a big problem in the world. But it's a, 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 normal, a normal way of dealing with stuff in the world. It's just how the world is. That's a normal. It's normal there. It's abnormal in the church. It's normal in the world because they're unsaved. They're under a, a satanic world system of beliefs. This is one of those beliefs. Then in verses 2 through 4, he lays out what I refer to as heathenistic reversionism in a Christian's life. He shows how it affects you, how heathenism, uh, how, how it affects you. Uh, this would be a familiar term, even with the word pleasure in the English, in transliteration. This would be a, a, a word... This word goes back to Socrates, out of the Greek. It became a word 
the Cyrenians and then the Ephraeans uh, coined this word and brought it into a very cultural way of living. So by the time of the first century, we're, we're deep into this as a culture. Many generations have grown up with this as a norm and standard in the Greek way of life. And so James is writing to Christian believers, as verse 1, 1 says, who have been dispersed abroad. Now, why would he bring this up to them? Well, they're now in that culture. They have been forced out of Jerusalem, and now they're into the Greek culture, the, Ro the, Roman, the Greco Roman culture. And this is a very prominent, well established cultural belief for generations. And so he warns them of it. He warns them you're going to be in a different culture. And you want to. And this is one of many, but he gives them a heads up, what we say, a heads up. Here's what I find interesting, because I'm always looking for markers. Now, I want you to pay attention, because you don't look at that, because you're looking for subject matter. And so sometimes you miss the obvious. But in four verses, he used the word T, uh, uh, to by a Y-O-U, second person plural. He used it 13 times. Now, in your English Bible, if you were to start counting the word Y-O-U, unless I miscounted, you would find it used 13 times. Now, I count, I say that that's a marker. I say that, that there's something there that you ought to pay attention to because the second person plural means y'all, right? Y'all. We're familiar with that, y'all. And so when you read that the next time, look at that because it just dominates the subject, does it not? You all. And these, and he's talking to, James is writing to the Jewish believers dispersed. In other words, they've been persecuted and they're, they're running. Much like, much like they did under Germany. So the question would be, who does heathenistic, not heathenistic, but hedonistic, hedonistic reversion affect the most? What would the answer be? Come on, this is, could be a gay question. You, right? You. Or you all. <laughs> right? I mean, how could you miss that? Well... You could because many times we miss stuff like that because we look for the big subject. And then we forget who it's addressed to. Well, it must be addressed to somebody else. But it's not. It's addressed to whom? You. Or usins. Now, I want to look at three ideas tonight as we inter introduce this to you. Hedonism is the pursuit. Now, you say, well, what was it really? What, what, how did this word get developed into a culture of generations? It is a pursuit of worldly pleasure. Listen to me now, and here's the key, of ultimate good of life. How, how, how would you know if you've had a good life? Because you have, your life has, you have pursued pleasure and have been, have been able to experience a realm of worldly pleasure. So people that did this, with, and, and it doesn't all mean that it's all, it's all bad. Much of it is, but how would we know what's bad? Unbelievers aren't going to pick up the Bible and determine what's sin and what's bad. And so what they did is they just pursued every area of, of lustful pleasure. Uh, and so it would depend on how many avenues of lustful pleasure they were able to find it. And let me tell you what they were looking for culturally. This is a philosophy of life. This is a philosophy of life in the Greek culture. It came, goes all the way back. To, um, 
Socrates and, and goes on beyond then. His students came out and began to really push it. The pleasure side overrules the opposite of the pleasure was pain. And so the thing that overcomes pain in life is just pleasure. Here's one of the ways the Bible explains this idea that the world had in the first century. Longer than that, but they had to address it like we have to address it today. It was the principle of eat, drink, and be merry and just die because that's all there is to life and then just die. So pursue all the avenues of pleasure that your heart desires. Experience them all. If it's not painful, it's pleasurable. And experience it all because you're going to die and that's the end. That, that's a lie. That's a lie that the world pushes and nothing could be farther from the truth. So that's the idea. For example, in Luke, the 12th chapter, i just give you an example. And you, they, you could do this in the business world. It doesn't matter how it, how it runs. could be done in many ways, but in, Mar, in uh, Luke, if you go to Luke 12 with me for a moment, I'm going to look at one. We're going to talk more about the prodigal son. But in Luke 12, in verses uh, 19, looking at 12, 19. I pick an, I'm, I picked up um, Jesus started a parable in verse 16 about a rich man was very productive and in verse 16 and he began reasoning to himself what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops and he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, this is hedonism. This is, this is a cultural view of the good life. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you've prepared? Because you can't take it with you. <laughs> can't take it with you. So is the man who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. See, what this man was doing, he was pursuing a life of pleasure in his own category and took no thought. See, it was about riches of the world rather than the riches of God. That was the conflict, wasn't it? And he, and listen, he sold his soul to the company store. Right? 16 times, you know. Okay. This, some of you are too young. Okay. Come on in and grab a chair. There you go. She, she's all right. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pam. We're at point two. I just, I just introduced you to the concept culturally. And, and, and I don't care what culture it's in. I don't care how they disguise it. This is what it is. They'll all talk about pleasure, though. So it won't be a disguise. It won't be a disguise because they're going to use the word pleasure. But it's hedonism. James connects the Greek word epithumia with this other word, hedone, or hedonism. When he says you lust and have not, in verse 2, the word he used for lust is epithumia, which is attached to the 
the lust trends of your sin nature. And so your pleasures are going to run off from your sin nature trends. There, there, are bo- there are body trends, there are power trends, you know, there's all kinds of trends that run off from your sin nature. Lust trends. And it depends on what you are. There's even ascetic trends. <laughs> and they're, 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 sometimes they're very culturally acceptable and, and, and hedonism can be like the man who was very rich and he kept building an empire uh, thinking that that was his pursuit of pleasure and he was very good at it. And culturally, everything looked good. On the other end, you got the guy who is, uh, you know, has to shoot up every day. And his life is going right down, right? He's destroying himself. And both of them are guilty of the same thing. Hedonism. And they're both doing it for the same reason. Pleasure. You go, and on both ends, you might say, that's a screwy way. Man, how do you I mean... You know, they're, for the rich guy who's doing it, you go like, yeah, but you're not smelling the roses on the journey, right? People are like, you know, you need to smell the roses, right? And he ain't doing any of that. And the other guy can't. He's lost all, all sensibility. You say, what, what's a rose? I can't smell a rose. I can't smell coffee anymore. You know, I've run my nose and my veins. and yeah, That's what we're talking about. But you see, he connects these two. James connects the two. He, enter, he introduces one in verse one and then introduces the other in verse two and he says they're connected. That's important because you got to beat them on two fronts. You got to win on two fronts to, to win over this. Um, he introduces the lust of the sin nature in James 1, 14 and 15. So it doesn't shock us when he brings it up in verse four in, ch- in chapter four. So you need to be familiar with that. I gave you other passages that would be familiar. Paul connected them, these two, hedonism and lust of the sin nature. He connected them in in Titus. (laughs) There should be a U in that. <laughs> uh, that would have been an interesting title on the on the billboard out front, wouldn't that? This is what we're going to study tonight. Well, anyhow, I, I'm supposed to be in Titus, uh, the third chapter, three through five, and I'm I'm looking at verse three. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived. Now watch this enslaved to various lust and pleasures. See, I, both words are used here by Paul and Titus 3.3. 3. Enslaved, see, enslaved to various lust and pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hate, for hating one another, and etc. He says, listen, you know how he introduced this idea? What is the source of quarreling? That never gets resolved. Fighting, warring, factions that never get resolved. And he says it's it's because these two things have been connected. Cosmos diabolicus and the sin nature have been combined, have been connected, and you're in a mess. Now, they they can be conquered. I mean, God has a grace plan. It's not a works plan either. It's a grace plan, which is wonderful. We learn from the story of the prodigal son, the parable. We learn from the parable of the prodigal son that hedonistic reversionism squanders divine blessings on hedonistic pleasures of the world. Let's go to that story because I'm still in Luke. So I only have to slide over to chapter 15. You're familiar with this story probably. But we're picking this story up in verses 12. You know, verse 11, a man had two sons. The younger of them, the younger son, 
said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And the father divided the wealth between the two sons. Now, in this story of the two sons, they're both going to be, uh, they're going to be both caught uh, by hedonism. And you really have to pay attention to see how they both got caught in it. And one thinks he's not in it, and the other one knows he's in it. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything, everything together. That's the divine blessings of, from the father, which is God in the story. And went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered the estate. So that's the divine blessings squandered all the divine blessings with the loose living. You know what he was after? Pleasure. He was pursuing all the different avenues of pleasure. He was trying to get all, and he was, and he was buying it, buying his way in to all the different avenues of pleasure the world has to offer. Now, when he had spent everything, okay, then the game's up. Now we turn to Robin or something. At least he didn't do that. A severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be in need. And he went and detached himself to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed his wife. For a Jew, that would be just about the lowest job. But you know what? Some of his training even in the midst of a mess up life, was still working in his favor. Went out and worked, didn't he? Huh? And he was willing to eat, listen, he was willing to eat what the pigs ate to get by. There's a little glimmer of hope there for him. He's not spending what he's getting now on loose living. He's spending it on just trying to get from one day to the next day alive. I'll come back to this story a little bit later on the prodigal son. It opposes hedonism, opposes everything sacred to God. It opposes everything sacred to God. The prodigal son reminds us that there is always hope in God for spiritual restoration. I love that. I mean, the moral of the story is God loves you and wants you home. God loves you and wants you home. God loves you. Don't be too arrogant to, to not know that you have a need for God and he desires to have a relationship with you. Always a need for restoration. The prodigal son confessed his sin and, was, and, and returned to the father. In 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, 16 and 17, it reminds us, now may our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the guy who died on the cross, was buried in the third day, raised from the dead, ascended back to the father and is seated at the right hand of God the father. That's why he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us an eternal comfort and good hope by grace. A good hope by grace. I love that. May that comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. What a wonderful, that's not the way of the world, but that is the way of God. Point number three, Satan is the master counterfeiter of the truth of God. Whenever you find a big truth of God stand out, he's the enemy of it. He's always going to counterfeit it. So here we have in verse four, back in James 4.4, 4, he says, you can be a friend of God or you can be a friend of the world, but you can't be a friend of both. You can be a friend of God 
or you can be a friend of the devil and you're going to be a friend of one of them, but you can't be a friend of both of them at the same time. They're diabolically opposed. And so, listen, he grabs everything that God, when God makes something like grace, he has works. He'll create songs that talk about it. So you, you've got to know that about him. He's a master disguiser. He, he's a copycat. He's a... Look at 2 Corinthians with me. I think I put it on your paper. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And verse 13, he talks about false apostles and deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, messengers of truth. And no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, but he's actually the angel of darkness. Right? And therefore, and then he goes on and talks some more about that. I'm just showing you the devil counterfeits. He's a counterfeiter. But you hold it up to light, and it, you, you, you can't take the light. You know, the people, they, you give them a bill and they hold it up to light and they say, okay, you can have your donuts. You see, the Satan looks pretty good until you hold him up to the light of God. When you hold him up to the light of God, you're like, whoa, look at there. This is the angel of darkness. I was watching a commercial the other day. You've probably seen this where there's the idea of a, uh, a death angel comes in and she grabs a refrigerator and then everything and you know it's a commercial that's what I'm talking about except we just haven't put it in advertisement Satan is the master counterfeit of the truth of God like God he puts a high value on friendship right look, look at James look, look at, just for a moment look at James 4.4 4 with me for a moment I, mean, I just quoted it a moment ago, but look at this thing I mean, the God of this world he, he, you know he, he, soon as God gets something then he gets something to counter it I mean he, he, he's, he's dumb as a brick he can't come up with anything he's not a creator of anything except chaos I mean and he has to have something to destroy he can't create anything he has to have something that God's created to destroy it. You adulteresses, that's spiritual. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, we're going to see a moment what God, see, God developed the whole idea of being able to be a friend of God, not just a child of God. But to be a friend, you know, you can be a child and not a friend. Have you not met anybody who had children that they couldn't be friends with them anymore because if they let them in, they would steal from them and they would do all kinds of bad things. They would threaten them if they didn't give them their welfare check or something. They would threaten them with their very life. These are your children, but they're not your friends. Please tell me you understand that. If you don't, you should. Because one day, they will not only steal from you, they will kill you. Because they have gone the way of the world. And so what my point is, is that you can be a friend of the world or you can be a friend of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. If you're a friend with God, you're an enemy of the world. It depends on what side you, what team do you want to play on? What team do you want to play on? One side is always going to lose. No matter how much they score, they're always going to lose the game. We do know that, don't we? James introduced friendship with God in James, the second chapter, 18 through 26, which we studied. 
because now we're in James 4 in the book, he mentions Abraham and Rahab as friends of God. One's a Jew, big guy, not tall, but big, big, who doesn't know Abraham is the father of the Jews business. And Rahab, a prostitute Gentile. How could you ever put those two people, what he did that we often miss? Look what he did. Someone, someone may well say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. We talked about the faith cycle. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But you are, but are you willing, this is a question, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? For example, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? The answer is, of course he was. Was he not justified? Was his works not justified? Yes. This is a believer who is not saved by works. But this is divine production in his life, and it's honoring to God. You see that faith was working with his works, divine production, and as a result of the works, divine production, faith was completed or perfected. That's how we got the faith cycle. This Look at the verse, James 2.22. I use that as a reference in the faith cycle, the completion side. Now watch verse 23, because he's going to quote G Genesis 15.5. The scripture was fulfilled. Listen, that's the key to the Christian life, is living your life, walking the word of God out of your life into your life experiences. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, walk by faith, not by sight. What he's talking about is walking your faith out of your Bible experience of truth in your soul into your practical everyday life. You know what it means to walk by faith? It means to bring the word of God into fulfillment, into practical application of your life. Here's the faith cycle. You hear the word of God? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes. This is the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. When that's done and you understand and believe it, it goes to believe that this is where your belief system is developed. Hebrews 4.2. Understand it and believe it. Hear it, understand it, and believe it. That moves it to application, the applying side, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You walk it out now. That This is the promise side of the word of God. This is the promise side of the word of God. Right there. Here's the performance side. There's the performance side. Now we come, to, it's our opportunity to apply this to our, our life. We're, we're walking the word of God that's in my soul. I'm working out of my life. Here I have learned it. I have learned it. Here I am living it. Living what? Listen to me. Not just learning the word of God, but listen to me. Living the word of God. And the scripture was fulfilled. The whole secret of the Christian life and Bible study is to learn the word of God so that you can live it. So the scriptures can be fulfilled in your life. And you can see the dynamics, not just of the promise of God, but of the, listen, of the performance of God in your life. This is the opportunity for you to see the character of God, that he's omniscient and he's, he's uh, omnipresent and omnipotent and righteous and sovereign and all these things. See, we miss things like, and the scripture was fulfilled. When the scripture is fulfilled, it becomes accountable, accredited to righteousness in the Christian life. Not salvation, 
but in the Christian life. It lays up for you rewards and crowns and things like that for eternity. What you produce here is not only beneficial to you in time, but into eternity. Has nobody told you that you can lay up for yourself treasures in heaven? That's what I'm talking about. And so he says, well, watch, I'm in verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What was the event that he had to walk the word of God out of? Offering Isaac, his only begotten son, heir to the Messianic patriarch. And he walked that out. If you know anything about Genesis 22, where that happened, you know that's a big deal. And it was that walking that out, trusting God. You know, I'll drop that thing. Turn around. I don't know how many times I was over at that board. I forgot about it. But anyway. John would have had a fit. I dropped it last night. I dropped it two nights in a row. He's probably put me in a timeout. Well, anyhow. Oh, I, I want to. I don't. I don't want to miss uh, that. There, here is uh, Abraham, <coughs> friend of God. Look, look at. Um, you see, a man is not. Verse twenty-four. You see that a man is justified by works. That's a. That's a believer, and not by faith alone. See, that's what we got on our board. You got to understand the faith rest. To understand that passage. And in the same way was listen. And in the same way, oh, you see how important that is. What are we talking about, friend, friends? Friends of God. How did Abraham become a friend of God? Right there. In that episode right there, God, God, God put him up way up there and said he's a friend of God. He's, not just a, he's not, not, not just a believer, not just a child of God. He's a friend of God. He's, he's, he's gotten higher in the status of fellowship by doing that. And, and likewise, Rahab, say that. Everything I just said about Abraham goes ditto with Rahab. Say, I love that. You should too. You should too as a Gentile believer. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? You see? Got two of them there. Friends of God. They, you, listen, it's one thing to be a believer and be a child of God. It's another thing to be a friend of God. You've just picked up high status. I, I can't tell you how important that is. You know, you might say, well, I know so-and-so. You might even say, I work for so-and-so. Somebody high up in the, the ranking. And if you tried to say you were a friend of him, and you'd lay it up and say, you went to him and said, hey, I'm a friend of, and he'd go like, I don't know that dude. I don't know him at all. And just because he works for me don't mean to have a friend with him. People would all the time ask me when I was a Graham, they would ask me, what's Billy like? I have no idea. You probably know more about him than I do. I just work for him. I don't know what he's like. I worked for him four years, that, and, there, and, and, and I don't know what he's like. I learned more from what other people wrote about him than I meant by, I wasn't around him that much. I just work for the organization. The difference with knowing somebody and being a friend of somebody, right? <laughs> Do you know the words to that song, Mike? Okay, as long as you know the words, you're all right. <laughs> you see, you wonder, what does Abraham, what could Abraham and Rahab have, possibly have in common that they could both be friends of God? <laughs> a 
a, ra a radio on their phone. That could, what could one thing be? Maybe they both had a radio. What they have in common is spiritual growth status of divine production. And the scripture was fulfilled. Oh, I love that. James introduces the, the devil's copycat version of friendship in James 4.4. 4. You adulteress, do you, speaking spiritually, you do not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? I'm about to close this up now, so just hang in there. One example is the prodigal. <laughs> You're like me. You carry them and have no idea what, how they work. I know how to turn them out and shut them off. That's about it. Listen, when you study the prodigal son, you ought to pay attention to him because you get a good look at the cultural idea here of hedonism. You get a good look at it. And when you look at it, you can see how to come out of it. Because this guy was up to his neck in a pig pen of hedonism. And that's what the devil loves to do with you. Take everything you got, destroy, destroy your reputation, destroy your name, destroy your credibility, and to sink you so low that you don't believe you could look up and find bottom. Destroy you. To get you in such a place that there's no hope out of it. You are a cook goose and we're going to eat you. But the truth is, the prodigal son was there. And he got out. The question is, how did he do it? The Bible is very clear. Jesus in this parable makes it very clear. In verse 17, it says he came to his own senses. Well, how important that is. I, I'm sick of the world. I'm sick of the world. You've got to be sick of it. To give up on the idea that pleasure can bring you some, any, the good life. Pleasure can bring you the good life. You've got you to you gotta be sick of that. He was so sick of where it had brought him to who he was when he, when he came and who he was now, who he was when he left home and who he is now. He came to his senses. In verses 20, that's in verse 17. In Luke 15, verses 21 through 24, he confessed his sin and returned to establish fellowship with God the Father. How important is that? See, it's one thing to get out of the big pen the muck and the mire of the world that enslaves you to its various pleasures. It's one thing to get out of it. It's another thing to stay out of it. How are you going to do that? God. God Almighty. You got to learn to have fellowship with him. You got to learn to walk with him instead of walking with the world because the world will suck your blood right out of you and sell it. Take your very life out of you and sell it. I hope you know that. You ought to know it from enough experience. Not, if not personal, friends, family members. Verse 32 emphasizes that his return and fellowship with God was the key. What he left, he was able to return to. Isn't that marvelous? Now, his brother didn't want him back. His brother didn't want him back. He had rearranged their room up, and he didn't want him back in it. He had his life settled. He made his, he made his bed, may he lie in it. That's the way the world treats you. He made his bed, make, make him lie in it. And isn't it good that God don't treat you that way? He says, you come home, you, you sleep in the bed that I made up for you. That's grace. 
That ain't works. It, it, this boy didn't have to come home and work his way back into the favor of God. When he returned, he was in the favor of God. When he confessed his sin, he was in the favor of God. Favor of God is where you always want to be. You can be in church and not in the favor of God. Did you know that? These are choices you have to make in your life, and you need to start making them. One of the good choices you've made is you come to the right church. So I'm going to teach you the truth. I'm going to tell it to you straight up and straight out. I'm not going to ask anything from you. Because I believe in grace. I believe everything God gives you is a good thing. He left fellowship with the world for fellowship with God. In the beginning, he left fellowship with God because it wasn't thought as enough. He went to the pleasures of the world, and he found out all they do is suck you dry and leave you empty with no hope. He came to his senses, confessed his sin, and returned to God. And God took him in as if he'd never left. Took him in as if he'd never left. Now, his brother didn't, but the father did, and the father run the show. So he told his, the other boy, you need to get over it, didn't he? You need to get over it. You need to get over it. You need to enjoy it. This brother, this son and brother was lost. He was dead. He's alive and home. And we're going to rejoice and be merry. You see, if you go back to the world, Peter, the second chapter, verses 17 through 22 says, in verse 22 it says, it's like a dog returning to his vomit. He goes back. Listen, the first time he ate it was good, and he thought it was so good, he threw it up and thought he would eat it again. Now, that's called a dog's life. And I don't wish that on anybody here tonight. But I'm going to tell you, you go to the world for your pleasures, and that's what you're going to get. And what you thought was a really good thing on the front side is going to turn out like Peter said, where he used the same word, Edenism, in verse 13, the word pleasure. You will always look for that word pleasure. Well, that's it for me. We'll close in prayer to allow the people that have come by internet off, and then we'll have private prayer time here with our congregation that's here tonight. And uh, if you have a prayer request, we will sure pray for it. So you be thinking about what you might like to have us pray about in your life. And we'll pray about that tonight. Let me close uh, our Internet audience tonight. Father, we're so thankful for those who have come our way by automobile and Internet. And for those who are on the Internet, we thank you. I pray you would stay with us. We have our studies we live stream them. You can pick them up off our internet, doctrinalstudies.com, as you well know. Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, and Sundays. We thank you for setting through this tonight with us and pray that you would seek the counsel of the Holy Spirit ministry within you. If you're a believer, he dwells inside you, 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Your bodies become the temple of God. You've become a mobile church for God. Everywhere you are, he is. That's a wonderful thing. If you've been a prodigal, then return to him tonight through the, the good common sense. The sense that the world will suck you dry and leave you, skin you alive and, and leave you for the vultures. Come to your good senses and leave it. God is still right where he's always been with an open door. Confess your sin if you're a believer. Come to Christ through the gospel if you're not a believer, that he died for your sins, 
was buried and raised from the dead, and he'll restore you. He will bring you to a relationship with him that is magnificent. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. You need to take that to heart and believe it. Come home. Come home, wandering child of God. Come home. The vultures are picking the flesh right off for you while you're alive. Come home and let God clean you up and restore you to good spiritual health. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.